and I'm a member of the ServiceNow Experts Bureau and a community MVP. I'll be presenting a demonstration of being slide records, glide records, slide records, ha, slides on glide records. I'll be starting at the most basic of queries and then introducing features uh, on top of those. Then I'll also be explaining what the query represents in my SQL SQL. If you have any questions, sing out and Lisa Latour will be uh, monitoring the chat to let me know. And uh, remember, there is a five second delay between asking the question and when we actually see it and when I can actually answer it. I'll be doing everything in my own personal instance. Uh, this session is being recorded. So if you need to come back to reference it, you may do so. Uh, by the way, my personal instance is in London. So if you, uh, you know, if you see any slight differences in uh, the way things are presented. I'll point out a couple of things, but uh, mostly it's the same as uh, uh, the uh, Kingston and uh, Jakarta releases. And all these things should work fine in those uh, environments. I plan on doing a series of these sessions on Glide Records so that um, what I don't cover today, I will be covering in the near future. Okay, this is me. I am a 35 year uh, IT developer. I have been doing this uh, as a uh, roll up my sleeves, nuts and bolts person for a very long time. I have uh, seven years in ServiceNow and uh, I have been doing development in ServiceNow for those seven years. I've uh, written over 150 articles out on the community and I have 10 videos out there. I'm certified in uh, several uh, areas and I'm also a certified instructor in 12 different topics. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is going to explain a few things about uh, Glide Record environments. So, Glide Records are ServiceNow's interface to the MySQL uh, database underneath the hood of ServiceNow. And what they've done is they've created a uh, object and that operates as a uh, way of returning a result set presenting a query first and then um, coming back with the result set all in one little package. And that is Glide Record. So a couple things. Well, actually, we're going to be doing more than a couple of things on the Axiom side. But uh, these are things you can pretty much hang your hat on. They're uh, things you, that are foundational. Uh, ServiceNow uses hierarchical structure instead of the relational structure. So I'll be getting into a little bit on what this means. Uh, perhaps a better way of seeing it and uh, explaining how this works inside ServiceNow. And it'll give you an idea of the reasonings behind it. Glide Record always does a select asterisk. Uh, this is not the most efficient uh, for those of you who are DBAs, but it works fine and it seems to be pretty fast. It does return everything. This has some serious pros to it, uh, but also has the con of not being uh, super efficient underneath the hood. You cannot do stored procedures. Uh, this is unfortunate uh, in capital letters because there are some really cool things I'd like to do. But you can do some uh, interesting things inside of uh, a Glide script, uh, which is ServiceNow scripting interface. And it doesn't give you quite the performance benefits that stored procs do. But uh, there are a couple of uh, aspects of this that uh, can be overcome with uh, the scripting side. It just isn't as fast as it would be if uh, it had been stored proc. Glide record object is sealed. In essence, it's a Java object underneath the hood and it's being transliterated uh, to the front end um, server side uh, for you as a developer. So when you're actually requesting a via query to the database and it returns uh, information back, the object itself is um, not uh, modifiable. So there are some interesting things you can do to it using, uh, you know, um, I guess the best way to put it is by extending the object, but uh, you can't do that inside of uh, the, uh, uh, environments that are set up for scoped uh, applications. So scoped version of Glide Record is not extensible. 
uh, but the uh, glide record on uh, in global is. Uh, this is a whole different topic, which I will skirt by right now, but I just let you know that uh, if you modify the glide record by uh, thinking it's a regular JavaScript object, it will not retain that information past uh, the execution of your code. There is no provision for order of precedence. Okay, what does this mean? Well, if you, uh, everything is anded, uh, there is an or condition, but uh, you can't really get into a parenthetical uh, type order of prece precedence. Uh, this is especially so in encoded queries. So I can't uh, move things around, uh, say I want this executed first and this executed second. Uh, it's pretty strict inside of the uh, environment and I'll get into this a little more um, during my presentation. Glide records do not usually err around on bad where clauses. Uh, how about almost never? Uh, there are two exceptions. Actually, uh, one of them is, has now been uh, suppressed. So there's only one now that is in a try catch arena. And uh, if uh, something bad does happen, glide record eats the error and uh, you get a more generic query back. So we'll get into that a little bit more and I'll demonstrate it. There's no support of the where clause uh, for this and this or this and this. And uh, this is the one of the parenthetical problems that I was talking about. So this particular scenario is not available inside of uh, the glide record. Kind of an interesting gotcha. I have tried uh, several flavors of this trying to uh, get around it. Uh, the only way I've been able to do it is by two separate uh, glide records and then merging the results in the script. With testing glide record scripts, uh, remember that uh, a script's background or fixed scripts are your best friend. I'm, go I'm going to be using script's background. This is uh, only available on uh, out of the box instances or what they're now calling baseline instances uh, via uh, a, uh, a security level. Uh, so you'd have to raise your security level up to uh, security admin in order to uh, be able to see this. Uh, fixed scripts gives you versioning. Uh, scripts background gives you a real quick and dirty way of uh, playing with various uh, aspects of the platform. You do not have access to the MySQL system tables. Uh, you can get at some of the system tables that ServiceNow is exposed. Uh, you used to be able to get at all of it, but in, uh, I believe it's Geneva, we had this uh, capability suppressed, and now you have to, uh, you basically don't have access to anything that's a system table underneath the hood. This is a, a good and a bad. I can't get any metrics uh, other than what ServiceNow exposes, so there are certain metrics capabilities that are not available. Uh, for those of you who are advanced MySQL people. But um, there are some nice things that are available. They're just not documented. So I'll be touching on that a little bit on a, on a later session. You do have access to table and field definitions. This is extremely important to understand. So as far as the system level stuff is concerned, you do have some of the, uh, the dictionary definition available to you. Uh, there are uh, some pretty cool capabilities in here that allow you to uh, do some things with the tables that are not patently obvious. And again, I'll be going over some of this in a later session. I'll be covering more advanced uh, topics as we scoot along with our various sessions here. There is a known long-standing issue with Glide Record. Uh, so this little puppy right here is one that has been overcome by uh, a, um, a method that is uh, now the recommended way of uh, getting hold of data out of the uh, glide record results set. I'll be going over this in this session. I'll be explaining what this means. The um, uh, stringification of the, res uh, of the returned value uh, is necessary and it is the suspect is the Java side of things where it's being converted to JavaScript. And uh, when you start looping through the results 
um, the known issue is that if you don't do it right uh, in the way you retrieve your information, you'll only get the values from the very last record retrieved. And that's the that's the interesting part of the glide record there. This is overcome by stringifying the return, and I'll get more into that. There's no union, uh, period. I have overcome it through coding. So there's this, I've got an article out there on how to union two things, two tables together and get the results back, combine them together, and then put them out into a uh, custom location if you uh, want to or utilizing them in memory. But uh, as far as the true unioning of two tables, there isn't an analog for that. All where statements start with add query and, um, and they are anded. So uh, your first add query, your second add query, your third add query all operate as an and, 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 and. You can interrupt that with uh, tacking an or condition to that particular and statement. So I can do the first one would be where add query dot add or condition dot or dot add or condition and so on would give me the where this or this or this is available. And I've got a couple of techniques that will show that will simplify that structure and allow you to uh, make more maintainable code. We'll be getting into that. Okay, please, folks, do not use GR. I don't, I, I've gotten to the point where there are, I uh, grade on a scale of one to 10, with one being the lowest grade whenever I see a GR in any code, I uh, immediately slap the one on it. Uh, this is a failing grade in my book. GR is not a descriptive variable name, period. So if I have an incident table, glide record I'm pulling back, call it incident records or incidents. Uh, don't call it GR. Uh, even incident underscore GR is kind of uh, okay, but it's still not a very good uh, descriptive thing. Use descriptive variables in your code when dealing with anything so that part of your self-documenting code is that it has readable variables. GR is probably where I find the majority of bugs in the code I'm asked to uh, uh, untwine and un, uh, you know, be spaghetti of some sort where GR is being passed through several different functions and people just totally get lost in development. And then I have to go and sort all this. And the first thing I do is I start renaming GR into something more descriptive about what's being pulled back. You'll find this all over the place in the code base. It is an extremely poor practice. Um, I, below bad. As with SQL, all string match queries are case agnostic. This can be good and this can be bad. Um, the nice part about it is it is standard for SQL. So in essence, it gets passed through to the actual underlying uh, query that's built by the glide record. And uh, you, un you, know, you can understand what's going on underneath the hood. There's no Java or C environment there where it forces you to uh, use the uh, string as uh, you know, a case sensitive type thing. This is only, this is the only place where this occurs. Operators are string sensitive. So if you use uh, like contains or starts with, those all have to be caps. If you try to lowercase them, uh, it will ignore it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the hierarchical structure. So to my SQL, when it goes hierarchical, a table is a base table. So in um, the, the way things work, this hierarchy you're looking at right here where incident problem and change inherit from the task and tables. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, these are called table extensions. To the database underneath the hood, it's a single table called tasks. So if I were to actually have direct access to the MySQL database, I would only see tasks there. Uh, incident problem and change are a um, filter uh, that are, is a way of explaining how to look at a particular grouping of records. So think of it as a type of task record. 
when I ask for all the incident records back, I get all the ins all the task records that are marked as incident records. Um, incident has fields that aren't contained in the task base, but are in the base table. So you can see where it can get very confusing, but for all intents and purposes, uh, underneath the hood, it's a single record. This is why the sys ID is an important uh, item to everything. It says, and it ties this record together for us to be able to understand how things are actually represented underneath the hood. So uh, for extended fields to be added on to the task table, they're actually uh, tagged as being belonging to the incident table but as far as the structure is concerned underneath the hood, they're just added onto the task table. So this is kind of the best way I found to represent this. Uh, but I wanted you all to understand exactly how the hierarchy worked uh, as far as the world is concerned underneath the hood. Um, tasks is just a single table. Uh, and it has a convention that allows this to be uh, represented as multiple tables. Now, what does this buy you? Uh, one, lookups are uh, remarkably fast. Uh, there's, probably it's the whole reason for doing this is that a, uh, a read function, uh, a select asterisk, if you will, is blindingly fast. And uh, it's the whole purpose for doing this kind of thing. Your data comes back extremely quickly. Updates and uh, inserts are pretty quick. Uh, not quite as fast as the reads, obviously, but uh, they are uh, probably comparable to the hierarch uh, to the uh, relational structure. Uh, probably uh, as quick, maybe just a twitch quicker. I haven't done any side by sides on them, so I'll leave that for you to do. But here's where you get kicked in the rear end, and that's on deletes. Uh, deletes because you have to go chase each pointer. You have to read the pointers in. Uh, those pointers are sys IDs. You have to read every one of these things in and chase them all down, all the way down the record structure. And make sure you're not blowing away some other record structure elsewhere. So there's a lot of pointer chasing that goes on underneath the hood uh, when you do a delete. Deletes are mind-bogglingly slow. And you probably experienced this uh, with what you've uh, been doing, if anything, in, uh, in the development world with Glide Records is that uh, deleting a record takes time. There are ways around this if you know what you're doing, um, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, the best way overall is just to uh, let the system handle it because when you go and actually delete a record, it chases all the chains for you and deletes it. If you do need something uh, deleted, as in I've accidentally created 4 million records out in CMDB and I need them deleted today, uh, contact the help desk. They've got uh, some serious magic that will allow them to go and wipe it all out in seconds. But uh, and it doesn't it uh, doesn't seem to uh, do terrible things to the database by leaving uh, orphans all over the place as far as orphaned records. So there you go. All right. So I'm going to do a, a live preview. I'm going to start building off of uh, a set of queries and. Um, what I plan on doing here is uh, uh, starting off with the very most basic of queries and uh, then, you know, working from there with it. So just uh, if you have any questions on, on this as to what I'm doing and why, uh, please pipe up. It's uh, quite all right to interrupt at this juncture, uh, but I'll be uh, just typing a query in. I've got a few examples I'll probably copy from and paste in, but mostly I'll just type it in to show you exactly how things work. Okay, so if you um, have never seen this before and don't know how to get to it, uh, this is uh, your uh, actual way of executing uh, scripts on the fly. And uh, this has a couple of things I wanna point out to it. Uh, it's very dangerous first off. Uh, so do this only in an environment that uh, you know it won't hurt anything. You'll have to raise yourself to uh, security by elevating your roles to get at this. It probably is available to you out of the box on your personal instance without having to do this, but on a regular instance, uh, you'll have to raise your security admin to see uh, this. Um, there is a new feature on this. It's pretty cool with London. 
uh, that after you run something, uh, it allows you to roll it back. And uh, this is a, a cool th feature I'll point out after I run my first query. All right, we're going to go go against the incident table for most of this example. And because uh, I love doing terrible things to the incident table. So you can do incident records. Again, do not do GR. GR is non-descriptive. It is, uh, you know, in my book, it's like uh, var x equals. It's just totally doesn't tell you anything about what you're doing. So I have no idea if this is the incident table. If I have 100 lines of code or if I'm calling through a bunch of things, I have no idea what this is. So uh, you get the idea. This is not a good way of programming. So what we're going to do is we're going to you know, start doing the habits right now. Uh, start building your queries so that they are easy to actually understand by a maintenance uh, developer or yourself after three or four months of being away from your code. So let me explain a little bit on things here. First off, new used to be uh, the convention. So essentially, you were newing a class. Uh, this is self uh, uh, newing now, apparently underneath the hood. I'm not sure when that occurred. It, um, I accidentally tripped across it a few months ago. So I'm not sure if it was Kingston. It may have been Jakarta, but apparently. Uh, new is no longer required on this. Now, what do I think about that? I think you should still slap the new on the front of it uh, just to be um, there with the current uh, programming convention. Newing it says uh, create a brand new one of these objects uh, that is pointed at the incident table and then return an open pointer to that uh, particular table. So when I do this, I'm building a, um, an object in memory that uh, will be going out and pulling back the information from the incident table. Okay, So the string, and it has to be a, a string or a variable. So I can actually do this. It's kind of interesting, too. Bar table name equals incident. It has to be a string. And Incident, by the way, is the name of the table. Notice it's all lowercase. If I come over here and I say incident, it looks like it's uppercase, right? Well, no. You have to go to tables. And uh, let's see, I've got, I can do that here. Tables. And if you go to tables under system definition, and this is where you go look up uh, a table name if you have any question at all. I type the word incident here. There's my incident table, and the actual name is the lowercase in case incident. And this is how I can go and grab my uh, actual name of the, uh, of the table. An alternative is to go look up the table definition for incident. So I can do this. This is the fastest way that I know. So there's another way, uh, which used to be how we used to do it. And if you go to the actual instant list, incident list view, and right click up here and then do a configure and dic ah, and this is bad when it's this way configure dictionary and poof nope i'm in com plans is this incident right here that's communications how about we go up a little bit but you can see i find out what table i'm actually in so configure dictionary, and poof, incident. Now, when you do it from the list view, and you scroll down, you'll see it also brings in every uh, column in the inherited structure, incident inherits from task. So you actually see all the fields that are inherited. This is a nice feature of glide record, by the way, in that when I do this newing like this, I actually um, have available to me uh, the underlying structure. So in other words, all the fields are returned. I don't have to join the tables together to get all the fields back. This is part of that hierarchical thing that's going on. So when I go get the incident records, I get everything from the inherited structure. So incident and task fields are brought back in one big group. So that select asterisk brings back both. So there's actually a join being done underneath the hood 
uh, that you won't see because it's the hierarchical thing. And it brings back everything having to do with um, that sys ID that's being brought back or that group of sys IDs. All right, so this is the other way you can find out about the name, so incident. So I can actually uh, drop this in as a variable right here and uh, it will take it just fine. So I could create more generic uh, glide record handling inside of a function, let's say, and just pass into the function the name of the table I want it to deal with. And that gives you a little bit more program flexibility when you're messing around with glide records. Cool, huh? All right, so let's keep going. Incident, I can't spell, so I'm going to double click and paste. Uh, dot add query. So add query is how I add a where. And uh, I can say uh, where active is true. Now, does it have to be in ticks or double quotes? The answer is it can be either as long as you're consistent. So I can actually do double quote, double quote. Let me blow this up just a twitch so it's a little easier to see. And um, I can, you know, as long as I, whatever I start with, I end with. Now, can I have this as just true? I believe so. We'll have to try it out and see. Incident records dot. So where active is true. And uh, I happen to know that the active field is here. I have to go find it. There it is. And uh, it's in the task table. So it's an inherited field. And notice I don't have to prefix it with, or prefix it with a task dot. It just buries it underneath and considers it all part of my returned uh, set. And see, I don't have to put task dot in front of it. Nice, huh? Uh, query. Again, that hierarchical thing. Query is a method that actually says, okay, uh, incident record, go construct the SQL for me and apply it against the table that's specified in the glide record statement and then bring me back the result set. After that, it doesn't do anything. So there's, uh, it's a uh, prepared uh, object. It's got the data, but it stops right there. And now the trick is, okay, how do I get at the information? So if I run this right now, nothing happens. Poof, I'll hit run script and boom, nothing happens. Notice this little thing right here, isn't that cool? This is brand new. Uh, I can actually uh, go out to this available here and look at the history of everything that was run just now. And uh, it actually gives me audit points on what was run in the script's background environment. This is a huge deal, and I love this. Notice it has a rollback, the script execution. Not that I have anything to roll back because I'm not updating anything, but I haven't tried this out, so this would be interesting to see what happens. And someone's done a much better in depth on this particular new feature than I have. Um, so I think it was Jaren Lungfist that did it. So um, check out uh, what Jaren's done. Uh, he's another MVP. And, uh, but this is pretty cool. All right, so I'm gonna back arrow. By the way, I'm doing all this right now in Google Chrome. Uh, Firefox seems to have a little problem with back arrow and losing your script. So if I back arrow, I get my script back in Chrome, not always in, uh, uh, the uh, Firefox arena. So I'll usually copy this out and paste it in my favorite text editor just to hang on to it. This is where fixed scripts really come in handy. Uh, fixed script uh, is a script you can execute and it has line numbers in the, here and it has uh, history versioning. You can roll back to previous versions, all that kind of stuff. But because of the handiness to run just simple queries here, uh, this is what I used for uh, messing around. All right, so uh, there's a neat little thing called uh, get row count. Now people have said this is expensive uh, as far as getting the number of uh, rows in the incident record object that were returned. The answer is I've done a lot of timings on this. I've not found this to be an expensive call. Uh, as a matter of fact, underneath the hood, it appears that Glide Record actually returns the count with the uh, records themselves. Now, here's a downside to this. 
incident records or you know your glide record object is not enumerable. You cannot go through it like this. This whole nomenclature here does not work. So this is not available to you with uh, glide records. It should be, but it's not. Um, one of the greatest enhancements that ServiceNow can make with glide records would be to allow this to be enumerable. Uh, you can play the game sort of, kind of, sort of, uh, with other, you know, by converting the entire object over to an actual JavaScript object, but this sort of nomenclature is just flat out not available. What you do have available to you is um, a where clause, uh, where command, and you can um, index your way through them using the next method. Now, until you do your first next, the pointer for the uh, first record is set to minus one or null. So uh, pointer here is set to uh, minus one or uh, not there. If you try to return something from incident record by directly accessing it here, so I do a gist dot print of uh, first off, I'll take this and I'll drop it in here. And uh, print is pretty much uh, available only from uh, global. You can't do it inside of a scoped environment. I use info usually, but you know, for purposes here, I'll do print. So if I print this, I'll, I'll do that. Then the next thing I'm doing going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I want to know about, um, you know, uh, let's say incident records that number. So I'm going to call it number. If I do something right here with this, By the way, this is perfectly legitimate if the pointer is set to the first record. But since the pointer is not set to the first record, nothing will be returned. Uh, people have gotten really confused over this, uh, people like Steve, uh, me. Um, when I was first starting out with glide records, I didn't realize that the next is essential to move the pointer uh, to the first record and then each additional record after that. This does a plus one underneath the hood on uh, the pointer. So it starts off with nothing and then moves to the first record, then the second record, then the third record, and so on. So this will either print off nothing or it will print off garbage. So we'll leave it there, and we'll get to see it. Okay, next thing we'll do. Um, by the way, uh, that's another nice thing is inside the editor on fixed scripts, you have tab available to you here. It, this is just a text box, and if you hit tab, you're actually tabbing off of it. Um, now, if we put it inside here, the first one will print off, the second one will print off, the third one will print off. Let's create a counter. Let's increment the counter. And then what we'll do is print off the counter. Now here's a nice thing about info versus print. So I'll put info in here. Here you can do what's called variable substitution. And it's some cool stuff. So we'll do one and zero and comma, comma, and uh, count. So we'll start with the zeroth element and move our way through. So now what this should do is it'll print zero, one, two, three, four, five, six on number. Now there's a gazillion of these things on my instance uh, as far as incident records are concerned. So I'm gonna limit the number of records that come back. I can do that by going up here. And then giving it some sort of number, let's say 10 records. And that will actually uh, limit it. All right, so what does this all look like as far as SQL is concerned? For, for those of you who know what SQL is, it is the um, kind of the standard database language that's come about over the last uh, 30 years or so. And uh, it's now pretty much been adapted by every major database out there uh, that runs hierarchical or relational. And uh, even the 
uh, big data crowd uh, use SQL. So let's uh, let's move on and let's take a look at this. So this is select asterisk from incident where active equals true. And uh, we'll set the limit. Actually, I think it's just limit is uh, 10. Anything else I missed there? Nope. So that is, you know, this query we did right here, or we're going to be doing, is the same as this query right here. Oh, that I could fit this query into a single statement and send it directly to ServiceNow, uh, the MySQL in the background. You used to be able to do that. There was a nice little thing called uh, gs.sql, but that was re removed in uh, an earlier earlier version of ServiceNow, and we no longer have it available to us because of security things. Um, but this is what this is, the transliteration of what you're seeing here. All right, let's run this. We're going to get 10 records back from incident. They're going to be arbitrary records, whatever it runs into first. We're not going to have them ordered in any way. And uh, we're going to be printing them off, uh, basically just the number field in each one. Now, this is interesting. So we're going to see what happens when we do this. I'm not doing anything fancy to this uh, particular value. So there is a this defect I was talking about underneath the hood, and it's with the Java conversion, I think, of the object, where it will print off just the last one in the record set. And it will print it over and over and over and over. If you ever see that, the, I'll give you a, uh, a way to get around it here. So let's see what happens. I'm, first off, I'm going to copy this out because I don't trust my uh, session. So I've got that in my notepad now. If you don't believe me, here is my notepad. And uh, OK, so now I'm going to run this and see what happens. OK, poof. Boom, I had an error. Wow, I wonder what that could be. Well, it says I'm missing a semicolon from the 14th line. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So what's wrong with this line? I have an open and I have a close and I've got all, everything looks good. So I wonder what's wrong with this line here. Well, I'm missing something someplace. So let's back up a little bit and find out where it is. And I am not seeing it here, so let's back up and see. That's another thing. If there's any syntactical errors in this, uh, this uh, script's background won't tell you, but fix script will, will likely point it out to you. So I've got one, one, two, two. That one looks pretty good. So let's try this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Right here, it thinks it's got a bad line. Here next, I'm backing up, looking through it all. I don't see a missing semicolon or a tick. And I'm thinking. I don't see where I'm missing it here. Yeah, it should be in the while loop. Oh, not where bell. Thing. That's a while. <laughs> All right. There you go. It helps instead of thinking out loud just to type on a meaning. So there you go. And you can see we start out at zero. And I like how it decimalizes things. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, notice on the very first one we had up there, there does not appear anything. Remember, it was outside the loop. But then when we hit the first next, it incremented and uh, put us on the first pointer. Now, the bug did not manifest here, notice. So I wonder if they've actually fixed it underneath the hood finally. Um, this is a lot, you know, how we got around this, I'll show you now, is we stringified it. And how you stringify something, obviously, is you plus tick tick it. So you'll see this nomenclature all over the code base out there. Uh, this plus tick tick is how you got around that particular problem with the uh, Java conversion uh, to the value. The better way, this is actually slow, the better way is to use value and feed it the string of the field you want to get. 
This is 16% faster. I ran the numbers. And uh, we'll actually return the information faster. So let's run it again and see what happens. Yeah, can you tell? <laughs> Notice if you're at the top, it gives you the number of seconds it took it to actually execute this particular query. Notice our get row count actually returned the number of rows. Try not to use this thing because it is a little bit slow for some bizarre reason, but I haven't really found you know badness in it as long as you don't keep repeating it over and over and over. I'm always after performance tweaks, always. All right, so I got this query to play with. How are we doing on time here? Okay, so next. There's a better way of actually saying this right here where I don't have to. Yeah. Hi, we have a question from Naresh. He says, can this script be used on client side as well, Glide Record? No. Okay, so here's a problem with Glide Record. Um, when you're moving from client to server, uh, the capability used to be there. Uh, it still is if you hack the heck out of it, but uh, I don't recommend this at all. Uh, there is a problem with executing server scripts directly from a client side. So let me talk about that a little bit. Client versus server execution. All right. When you're working with the client side, user experience is all. Okay. What does this mean? It means any delay in execution should be avoided. Okay, so why is this pertinent here? When you are executing something on the server side directly, it's called synchronous. When you run a synchronous um, execution, you are stopping the user from using their browser any further, or at least that particular um, browser interface that they're using, which means that they're on a wait mode until the server finishes whatever it's doing. Uh, if you execute a glide record directly from a client script, it has to go out to the server side to actually run it, which means goodbye, uh, might as well go get a cup of coffee, you don't know how long it's going to take to come back, anything like that. Do not directly execute ever. Instead, and this goes, by the way, for this next thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, use Glide Ajax. Glide Ajax uh, gives you the capability of doing sync or async. Async says, fire it off, and when it gets done executing, return the answer. But don't hold the user back. So the return will come back without interrupting the user. It'll suddenly magically start populating information into the uh, memory of the uh, browser. Do not use sync. So there's none of this, you know, go out and execute this thing and wait. Sync is bad. Sync is awful. Sync is evil. Uh, does it have a use? There may be a couple of them in there, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. I do everything async that I possibly can. Here's another one that gets you. Glide record. Or, I'm sorry, um, business rules. Business rules are synchronous. When you execute a business rule, it does that lockdown because the front end is talking to the back end for the duration of the business rule, rule actually executes. There is an asynchronous business rule. So if you have anything that's after, which is synchronous, use um, async instead if you can. And a lot of us have moved over to this uh, paradigm and we've gotten off of it just to free up the user and improve the user's experience. Uh, before business rule, you're sunk. You got to use, uh, it's a synchronous. But uh, if you need, if you can use an async or a fire an event, I use async for most everything. Every now and then I'll fire an event and then release the user back to doing stuff. So if it can be run as an after, You've got these two ways of doing it. But the, uh, the Glide Ajax from the client script is the de facto method I use right now. I don't even think of any others. Does that answer the question? Uh, let's see. 
he didn't respond, but okay. it's almost like a client side server script. Yeah. Okay. Glide so, Ajax on the clients. Yeah. Glide Ajax. Do not use Glide Record on the front. It's a server side animal. Uh, with you know that means it's uh, executed on um, service now, and it's not executed in the browser. So got to be very very careful not to impact uh, browser performance. All right. So moving on, uh, let's talk about this active true thing. So this can be replaced with a slightly better performance uh, thing called add active query and then you give it a field and this actually replaces having to do an add query on here now you know what's the difference between these two uh, slight performance improvement that I've seen with active query but I think it's uh, a placebo effect I um, haven't quite run serious numbers on it yet but if you have to execute a query over and over and over a skillion times um, this might actually save you a few milliseconds here and there. Uh, this is up to you which method you really want to utilize. I um, I have no real preference, and uh, if I have to do something, I usually these days use the add active query. All right, I'm gonna leave. Actually, this doesn't take a field. My apologies. Poof. There we go. All right, so. This is fewer strokes, I think. I don't know. Put that one back in there. Nope, lost it. Um, if you're a lazy typist, then maybe this is uh, a bigger deal. <laughs> one or two strokes less. <laughs> anyway, I want to really hammer home the point that this thing has no iterator, so you can't do a for loop around it. Uh, what you can do is kind of interesting. Uh, there is an exception to the rule on, you know, on being able to get at certain components of it, but I'm not going to go into those in this session. So there are more advanced things you can do in here uh, with the uh, glide record itself. And uh, it does have that pointer and the pointer is resettable. I'll get into that in a later session. So you can set it back to the beginning of the record set again, if you want to loop through it multiple times for whatever reason. I've had to do this uh, um, like three or four times in my career, but uh, the technique is a good one to know. So you can reset the pointer and you can reset it to any position that you set up a bookmark for. So I can go through and actually say, I want, uh, I want a bookmark set at this particular record I found, and then I want to be able to reset to that location. So that capability is there too. There are a couple of really interesting things with this. Um, Again, this is an immutable structure. So if I want to do something like add a new field to the uh, incident records um, uh, glide record thing. So let's say I come in here and I want to set every record to have stuff variable. Now this is legal in JavaScript and actually in some cases is a normal coding practice. So that every record suddenly has a stuff variable. If I come down here and do a gs.print of incident uh, records dot stuff uh, equals one, the very last, or I'm sorry, uh, stuff, the very last one that was run uh, will actually show that value. But the minute execution's over with, this disappears. Not only that, but if I decide to pass this through to an, another function, um, let's say a fire through an event, it gets stripped off because it's not really part of the object. You have to actually go in and extend the object underneath the hood by extending the uh, JavaScript language. So, and yes, you can do that with uh, ServiceNow. However, for whatever reason, this is not doable. You can't extend this object anywhere else but global. So in a scoped environment, which has a different type of glide record object underneath the hood, uh, scoped environments, this is a non-extensible object in the language. All right, where do I want to go next? Let's talk a little bit about adding our very first query. Okay, so let's run this, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a sec. Poof. 
poof. Notice it took the last one. I could have put a nine, you know, I could have printed this out too as well and shown you that it was the ninth record. Um, this value is meaningless um, outside of the execution of my program. So, uh, you know, as far as that object is concerned, uh, the object is not really changed. Okay, so let me grab one of these. Uh, incident 41 looks good. I have no idea what it is. And um, let's see how I'm doing here. I got a few more minutes. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So I'm going to comment this thing out here. And I'm going to uh, add in a new query. I'm going to say incident records uh, dot add query. This is a where clause. So I'm going to get rid of this active query thing altogether, poof, just to really show. And uh, where number, which is a field inside of the uh, table, this has to be the real name of the field. So if it's a custom field you've added, then it will be U underscore, right? Or if it's a scoped field, then uh, this table name will have the scope uh, name, and then you can use the value in here and it would work just fine. But in global, and for an out-of-the-box table like incident, uh, numbers actually off of the task table it inherits from. Now, I'm going to feed it this value. So this has an implied equals. We'll take three variables, or three parameters. Uh, the first string is the name of the field. The second one is the operation you want to uh, have executed. And the third one is uh, what you want to have executed against. What does that do to our SQL query down here? Well, uh, I took away the active true stuff. Let me put the limit down here. And now we have uh, where number is equal to and single tick just like that. So this is the actual SQL for this query up here. Stephen? Yes. Somebody said um, add active query parentheses does not accept parameters. Right. I said that. I, oh, okay. I removed it. Incident Thank you. records uh, add active query. And I had parameter in there and then I took it out. So this is this is a legitimate way of doing this. The other one was not. So thank you. Thank you for mentioning it. Um, all right. So equals actually is a default parameter for add query. So if you leave the second parameter out, uh, it will actually default to equals. You'll see this nomenclature everywhere in the code base. So whenever you see this, usually it means they, the person who wrote it was a beginner uh, developer on ServiceNow and didn't understand that they could default this. Uh, those of us who have been in the environment forever, uh, we're lazy programmers and we leave this off. And uh, you'll see that everywhere in the, in the code base. So I'm going to leave it in to begin with. and uh, go ahead and run this query. Now, we'll only be returning a single record because we're very, being very specific about which one we're coming back with. So I'm going to run it. And I need to remove that one up here. We only caught, brought back one record. is very specific to being uh, Inc. 41. Let's go back one. Now I'm going to get rid of this and show you how it has the same effect. So now I can remove this and rerun it, and it had the same effect. So the equals is default. It is not necessary in your in your code. Here's another cool thing. I can actually make the field name a variable, right? And that way, I have the power of being able to feed it a table name and a field name uh, through perhaps a generic uh, function, you know, a more generic function, and say, go do this, and it will go fire it. Now, I'm going to show you another cool thing here in a minute. I'm going to come this out and then run it again and watch what happens. Poof. Same effect. Cool, huh? So you have the ability 
and I want to make sure I cover one more thing after this. To uh, to feed everything here is a variable. There's another one I can say you know um, test value equals and then give it this. Now you're beginning to see the beauty of the uh, glide record and um, object itself in that almost everything that you want to feed to it can be a variable. I can even feed the limit. I can actually set up uh, tests to introduce new ad queries based on values that have been tested for. And here's the really cool one. Uh, here, I'll go ahead and run this and show you how it brings back the same thing. I can even give it this. Cool. And poof. And this is another thing that will sometimes happen. Uh, there will be a, a garbage cleanup goes on, on underneath the hood, and it will come back all sorts of stats. Ignore them. You're interested in everything that says asterisk and script. This is a, a, a script background problem. So there you go. Pretty cool that you can do this kind of thing uh, with it, and you can be generic, you know, uh, var. Uh, limiter equals 10. I can drop that in here as well. Okay, that's it for this session. Any questions? Give you a couple minutes to it's, ask. Yes, add active query parents is not ex accept is not accept parameters. <laughs> it just came yeah, someone, someone was answering someone else oh, i see that okay sorry <laughs> and i've let people know that there's a part two three and maybe four coming up and they wanted yep. to know if it was today <laughs> no 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 yeah it's uh we have a there's a lot of material to cover and i just was getting off the ground and there was a lot of prep you know to let everyone know exactly uh what's going on i do have um presentation I'll be giving uh, you, Lisa, that uh, you can give to everyone. Okay. Um, this has the additional resources on it. Uh, these are the things I put together and put out on the web. I will be putting more stuff out on, on uh, the community. And uh, these are all articles I've written that will take it to the next level. Uh, the part one, uh, I cover some of the stuff I covered in this session. Other things I've done in this session are because they're easier to explain, uh, you know, in this format than they are trying to write about them. So uh, between this, this video series and some of the things I've been writing, you should get a complete picture of how glide records actually work. We had somebody also just post, maybe we can see get for one record instead of add query. Uh, I'll be doing that in a future session. Very good. Let's see if we've got any other questions coming. Yeah, remember this is uh, just barely getting off the ground here. Yes, so uh, Naresh has a question. Sure. I'm waiting for him to type it. Oh, yes, our YouTube delay is um, <laughs> yeah. sometimes um, hard to deal with. It's okay. We can run over a little bit of time. Not a problem. Okay. Sometimes I ran an infinite loop when using for loop how to control slash end that and what are its impacts on the browser okay um i will be getting into some of that in the next session but uh to give it to you real quick about how things are functioning in that regard um the uh while next is extremely important to understand what it's actually doing um, so on a while next, what's actually happening here is it's iterating through underneath the hood 
uh, with each record, moving the pointer next record, next record. If nothing is returned at all, this does not execute. It's as if this is a null object, and it is, and it falls through. So next actually handles that. But if you've got something where you're looping through somehow, and you appear to be in an infinite loop, you can actually do a break in here. So I can do a test if and have a count, say if count equals three, um, then I can say break. And it will break me out of this. And that way I have a way of stopping myself uh, based on a condition. And I can say, you know, if something happens a certain way, I can get out of the loop, uh, even though I found what I needed to find or, you know, something like that. And I could say if number and utilize my number up here, you know, and have uh, remove my field name and say if I bump into this, and I hate that, go away, um, then it will break out. And we'll find out what count number is. Uh, we can print off the count when it gets finished, but that's okay. It'll actually show us what count it made it to. So if, watch what happens when I run this. It'll break this out prematurely. So run. And it gave me a break. Uh, what I do wrong if, oh, because I didn't tell it. That's another thing I wanted to show you is you have to put it in front of it what you're testing for exactly, and it has to be from the object. Just read my mind. It didn't bust out. Yes, it did. Now, if I want an earlier one, let's go with 24. It'll kick out when it hits 24 and doesn't print it. Notice, because I did it before. Uh, if I want to do a couple other things to, you know, I have the ability to be very complex with what I'm testing for, you know, in count equals five, or if count is greater than five, or count is greater than five, you know, that kind of thing, I can say, get out. So there are various ways you can control uh, getting out of the loop early and uh, not having to go through the whole thing. So if I got tens of thousands of records and I have certain things I want to do prior to kicking out and then I have a certain condition I've reached, you know, where I only want to do 12 records out of 2000 for some reason, or if I want to do every other one or, you know, there's all slew of things you can do to this. Now forcing next inside of here, is not a recommend practice. Will it let you do it? Yes. So there is a way of actually, um, you know, uh, in a for loop, you can do every other one, like uh, skipping. You can do skipping. So do uh, two, four, six, eight, that kind of thing. This is the how you go about doing that inside of a glide record. This is a little more advanced. And it's kind of an intermediate level technique. I do not recommend it because it's very difficult to maintain this sort of thing. If you got to play this sort of game, my recommendation is first convert the record set to uh, from a glide record to an actual JavaScript record, and then uh, uh, object record, then uh, fool around with the objects in that regard. And it actually is blindingly fast in memory on the server side. So uh, even with tens of thousands of records, I've been able to uh, play that game. The, I'll, I'll get into that more in the advanced stuff uh, in a couple of sessions down the road. But uh, I hope that answers the question. There are some techniques to uh, work with here that you can uh, play around or, you know, and make it do what you want it to do like a for loop, but uh, be very, very careful. Uh, is it possible to get into the infinite loop on here? Uh, yes, it is if you're resetting the pointer a lot. Otherwise, no, it'll eventually run out of records because next is next and it will continue to do so until it, if it hits the last record and then it has uh, it stops at the last record. And the last record is actually available then to you after you're finished. Okay, great. I haven't seen any more posts on the, the chat. But again, any user who's watching this later can post your questions on the community thread that I have included. And we hope that uh, you do post your questions there and Stephen will get back. Additionally, on those reference URLs that he showed, um, I'll make sure to grab those links as and put those on the community. A question um, on this 
the thread for this uh, this session today. Is that correct, Steve? Yes, it is. All yeah, right. I'll give you I'll give you the prezo. It's just got the links in it, basically. Fantastic. Okay, we should uh, probably have another session next week, and we thank you all for your attendance today. Thank you, everybody.